You're listening to The Interview Show with Seth Goldstein on the phillytech.org netcast network. Thank you to our sponsors, aweber.com, wistia.com, and getflywheel.com. And welcome to another edition of the interview show. I'm here with Drew from City Coho. Before we get to Drew, let's talk briefly about helping fund the network. If you go to patreon.com slash phillytechorg, you can support us monthly with a monthly donation and help us build out the network. Or if you just want to do a one-time donation, we're running an Indiegogo campaign right now. Go to soco.bz slash Indiegogo, and you can help us out Drew, that way. Let's Drew, Drew, who are you and why do we care? Okay. Well, thanks for having me, Seth. Um, community manager here at City Coho, which is a co-working community on 24th and Walnut Street in Philadelphia. And uh, we're a community that kind of builds itself as the space for professionals who give a rip. Um, so the people that you'll find here are usually companies that are actively working on issues, whether they be social or environmental. Um, so for us, you know, we, we've been billed as like the sustainability space, um, you know, the, the place for sustainable companies. That's kind of a loaded term. Um, but for us, we kind of have a very broad definition of what sustainability means. And for us, it's the triple bottom line. So it's companies that understand their impact in terms of their environmental footprint. It's companies that understand their place in society and how they're benefiting society as a whole. And it's also companies that understand their economic impact. Um, and it's our kind of vision that having this holistic perspective of your company is actually going to build stronger, more lasting businesses because you're actually accounting for everything that like you're impacting and it isn't impacting your, your company. So you're making decisions that, that maybe are longer term focused. Um, oh, cool. So are you guys an incubator or are you a co-working space? We're a co-working space. So we have we have an incubator operating out of the space. Um, we have the co Philly incubator operating here. So that incubator is primarily focused on preparing um, largely impact-oriented startups for crowdfunding campaigns. Oh, wow. Um, like, like Indiegogo and Indiegogo, Kickstarter. Kickstarter. They're actually we're, – we're in the process of building a fully functional media lab with them. So they can offer their portfolio clients, you know, opportunities to actually produce their video content on site. We have a project in the works right now. The, the timeline is a bit uncertain, but um, it, it looks like we're going to be building a 3,000 square foot event space. Oh and, wow, that'd be awesome! Yeah, and the new Sierra Tower just being built by Brandywine right now across the river. Oh, so, so you're going to be moving to Sierra soon? Is that what it is? No, actually, I mean the co-working business. So. I'll, I'll give you some background. This, okay. this co-working business was created um, out of a partnership between um, a nonprofit that I, I work for called Sustainability Nexus, um, and that, that was co-founded by a gentleman named Max Onheiser, who used to actually run the lead certification program down in D.C., um, and he's a, uh, a lead fellow architect. Uh, well, he kind of refers to himself as a recovering architect. He actually does more sustainability consulting now. Mm -hmm. um, and he was actually the lead consultant on that new Sierra project. Um, oh, wow. Very cool. Yeah. So the, I, I don't know the certification that they're targeting, but it's somewhere around silver or gold. Um, oh, and, you're, and you're also, your building is actually, that you're in right now is a lead certified building, right? Yeah. So actually, um, the... We're, we haven't received the plaque yet, but we've, we've registered the building. So um, what we're, we're aiming for a platinum on the building as a whole, because um, our, our investor um, and the building owner, Charles Block, put about $11.5 million into this building over the last 10 years. And it used to be a kind of broken down railroad depot turned office building, and it was the Rosenbluth Travel Headquarters. Um, and when that sold to American Express in 2003, um, about three or four years later, um, Chuck bought the building back and has been rehabbing it ever since. So in terms of environmental performance, it's pretty top notch. It's got like a very tight envelope, brand new glass, like brand new windows, polished concrete floors, low VOC paints, 
We built a green roof on the top that has a 17,000 gallon water reclamation system. Oh wow! So this is a green building. It's almost as good as is it as good as the Comcast Tower? At the what tower? As as the Comcast Tower? Isn't the Comcast built center? I actually don't don't know. I know that. I think that was a WRT project. Um, I don't know who uh, or what certification that they have. Like what? I I just know that that big ugly thing on the top of the building is actually a a sanitation thing. Yeah, yeah. I I mean, Chuck is trying to employ a number of of cool green features in the building. It's Um, it's kind of like you know this this kind of broken down building, and it's now becoming this kind of tech hub in Philadelphia. And he's actually like he's attracted some incredible tenants because he's been so like kind of stringent on you know making sure that everybody gets like daylight and views, making sure there's no carpeting in the building that's adding chemicals to the breathing zone, you know, making sure that like you know there's lots of daylight so we can like lower our power load. So like a typical building in the city probably pay, pays about a buck a square foot for energy. We pay about thirty three cents. Nice, very good. So, Very good. So, so City Coho is a environmental impact um, conscious um, co-working space. Yeah, basically. And then also, I mean, we have companies. So I'll, I'll, I'll go like a little meta on you about why we're doing this, um, just to kind of explain some of the decisions that we made. Mm-hmm. Um, so the point of Sustainability Nexus as a whole, um, the nonprofit behind the space, is um, it, it actually came out of an idea from a book that was written by Paul Hawken, who's like a very notable kind of sustainability thinker and speaker. Um, and he wrote this book called Blessed Unrest, where him and his team wanted to categorize and kind of list all of the organizations in the world working in social and environmental impact. And they wow. thought, you know, considering their best guess, that it would be somewhere around 50,000 organizations. And in a year, they stopped counting at 100,000 organizations, and they think that there's somewhere between 250,000 and 500,000 organizations, which means by the number of people working in that movement, it's the largest movement in human history. Oh, wow. And if you told anybody working in that movement that there's that many people working alongside them towards common goals, they'd be flabbergasted. Oh, I'm sure, yeah. Yeah, it's like nobody understands that there's that many people who share your vision and your mission. Um, And we're finding that, like, though there's been amazing progress um, and those, you know, those victories need to be celebrated, um, we're finding that that the movement as a whole is suffering from these kind of classic symptoms of disintegration that you'll find in any organizational body that's not totally integrated with their process. So you have organizations that that are working within the same space that don't realize that they're united in mission and and they don't realize that they're working on the same issues with with split resources. And what happens is there's overlaps in scope of what they're doing. There's gaps in scope of what they're doing. There's adversarial relationships created between would-be allies. Um, there's lack of integration and process. So basically you have a lot of companies that are working on their piece of the puzzle or organizations working on their piece of the puzzle, but there's no like uniting body that is, you know, has like the thousand foot view of what the puzzle looks like to tell them how to orchestrate themselves with other organizations. And so that's where you guys come in. That's what we're trying to do. We're trying to be like, we don't take ownership over what these organizations are doing. We simply network and connect them. I see. You know, kind of being the connector. Yeah. So we're like the connective, the connective tissue between all the organizations working in the sustainability movement in Philadelphia. Oh, that's clever. I like the idea. Yeah. So, and then the co-working space is kind of a result of that mission. Okay. So we found that co-working is very much in line with what we're doing in terms of community building within sustainability. And we're realizing that this movement is actually much larger because there's a lot of these innovation-focused organizations and tech organizations that share a lot of these values, but they never identified as companies that were triple bottom line or double bottom line or even thought about ways of addressing that impact. And by being here and co-housing with organizations that that do have a really kind of firm idea of, of what their impact is, 
we're creating organizations that have networks and connections that make them stronger over the long term. Oh, that's very clever. So it's, it's a lot more than just a co-working space. Oh, nice. It's a lot more than just a co-working space. Yeah, I mean, we, we say that we, um, we build a co-working space to serve the needs of a community rather than building a community to serve the business of a co-working space. Yeah, which makes sense. That's very cool because you need to set yourself apart from all of the other co-working spaces. I mean, there's Indy Hall, it was one of the originals, and there's Seed Philly, and there's mm -hmm. all these other you know co-working spaces that are out there. It's nice to see one that actually has a mission that's a specific mission, you know? Oh, I mean, like, a lot of the co-working spaces out there are there to serve a mission, but a lot of it is very focused on serving, like, community. But yeah. we want to... Um, we want to focus that on a community that's very like values driven. Very um, cool. So there's a couple of spaces around the world that kind of reflect um, a little bit of what we're doing, but we're the first one in Philadelphia that's that's pretty much entirely focused on kind of building that community within sustainability and also connecting them with tech companies. Very cool. Very cool. So Jura, what's your background? I know we talked before the show. Um, that you, you always want to be a lawyer, and somehow you end up in sustainability. How did that happen? I mean, you're uh, apparently a prosecutor. Yeah, so I, I mean, uh, when I was in seventh grade, like, my entire class as an exercise had to write down a couple of terms about, like, what you know about the other people in your class, and apparently, like, six or seven of them in a class of 30 wrote, Drew wants to be a lawyer. Um, in, in seventh grade? Yeah, so, I, I mean, I have two lawyer parents. One's a uh, one's a federal prosecutor. She's still still a federal prosecutor, doing mostly you know racketeering focused cases. Wow. So it was kind of cool reading the paper and reading about my mom taking down the Russian mob, <laughs> and uh, my dad was more in, like kind of investment focused and like business minded. Um, so he's now retired. She's she's still a federal prosecutor, but. Um, so I grew up in Philadelphia. Um, we, were, we were both joking around earlier about we we're both products of friend schools. Yes. <laughs> um, so I went to Abingdon Friends, and um, during I mean during my time there, Abingdon Friends is very focused on kind of like building the power of community and like like. Oh what? yeah, they all are. Yeah, Mr. Ryan was very much community focused. Exactly. Sometimes to their detriment. Like, did, like, did you have the means for business? Let's let's talk about how ineffective Quaker decision making can be. Oh my God! It drives me nuts. <laughs> I, I mean, honestly, just trying to find a mascot. They didn't get a mascot until like ten years after I left the school. <laughs> now we're the dragons. I'm like, well, fine, you're something. Okay, good. Yeah, we we were we were the kangaroos, and then there was a lot of argument over whether we should be called the fighting kangaroos because Quakers don't fight. <laughs> and uh, yeah, yeah, there was I, there was a lot of my time spent. Trying to find consensus, but actually, on, on the mascot does teach you is, you know, like the point of I guess the committee chair is like the person the head head committee member or something, is to find like the feeling of the room instead of saying like this is how it is, and that's actually proved to be really useful like in terms of my professional life, just kind of finding the feeling of the group and trying to reflect like all that you've heard instead of rendering a decision. Exactly. I mean, there, there's some merits to, to quick education, you know, definitely positives, and then there's some downsides. It's like no yeah. one can agree on something, and therefore nothing gets done. Yeah, know? exactly. Or you just have to agree on something and then do whatever you want later. <laughs> yeah, exactly. By your love and power, we'll, do, we'll deal with this later. Exactly. So. Yeah. So uh, I'll go on. So after after that, I went to Temple University, and um, I was a business student there. So um, I, I stayed very much in Philly, and um, Started off as an international business student because I completely just had it in my mind that like, oh, international business, that's like important people stepping off of airplanes with briefcases. That's hey, at least you did business. I was a history journalism major with Myers in Anthropology and Poly Sci at Delaware. Oh, my God. The only thing I could use is journalism, and I'm still yeah. kind of using it. <laughs> well, you're doing that, so that's a good thing. Um, a little bit, yeah. But I'm also a web designer, so well, that figure, you know. With no business sense. It's a good, a good skill, man. Um, I've been in a lot of startup meetings where it's like they don't have the developer in the room to actually tell them what's feasible. You're like, we want to build a Craigslist. And I'm like, <laughs> oh, my God, no, you don't. <laughs> now, a good web developer will cost you, and they will give you a product that is truly amazing. 
Absolutely. Um, so I was, I became, actually I switched majors, I became a legal studies student, went through their kind of, um, they have a, a couple of really good entrepreneurial law classes, still very much like in the mindset that I was going to become an attorney. Bam, 2010 was like the worst year possible to be an attorney. Um, so I was saying before the show, it's like, you know, I knew people that were $200,000 in debt and, you know, they, lawyers to pay it off. Exactly. Yeah, they, they were making like $50,000 a year and it's like, you can't really start a life when you're like brand in debt. Like that's the biggest thing about the student loan crisis that's driving me crazy that people aren't talking about is like, how much is that going to affect our economy? Like 10 years from now when people can't buy a house or like, absolutely. Mm -hmm. school. So I was very lucky. I went to Temple. I went to a state school that actually was was affordable. So it made and a decent and a very good state school. Yeah, it was great. It was a great education. Um, and at my time there, I uh, I had like the great fortune of having this capstone professor named Michael Hagee. and um, Michael was a former um, a former colonel in the military. And oh, well, uh oh, is that either a good thing or a bad thing? He was he was the most laid back colonel you'll ever meet in your life. Um, oh, that's good. The guy who like understands the system and can innovate around it. Oh wow! So he knew to work with the system. Yeah, which is like the best. So it's like he understands like all management philosophy, like kind of stems from the military. Yeah, but he also exactly. What works and what doesn't, because of his experience. And the man also like he just feels no fear. Um, it was it was pretty inspiring to to learn from him, but um. I was coming to that like conundrum that every college senior has, and it's like, what do I want to like devote my life to? Like, what am I passionate about? Like, all these questions. Uh -huh. Like, you know, you have to write on a job application that drives you nuts. And um, I, I just had the good fortune to to be around him, who introduced me to this woman who became my partner on my first venture. Um, that was a company called Green Technology Recycling. And oh wow! Okay. I, I started that. It was it was, it was a company that I actually started about ten years before I took took over, um, but had been kind of shelved, and we we totally revitalized it. So I became their their partner and director of business development. Okay. Uh, straight out of college, so like I graduated, and as I was in my cap and gown, like taking pictures on the steps of my business school with my my parents, I got a call from my partner saying, "Yeah, let's do it." Like you know, we're starting up next week. Like I'll see you in the office. Eric, you leave school and you have a job. It's awesome. Yeah. I mean, I'm guessing a lot of the people in this program or who are going to be watching this are kind of entrepreneurship focused. Mm -hmm. um, I took equity and not salary. And I will tell you that you, you better have some money put away. Like you better have something to like a nest egg or like a sugar. Or a spare bedroom in your parents' house. Yeah, exactly. I mean, you have to have some sort of safety net because I was very much going into this like, yeah, full steam ahead. Like, I run a company now. Like, this is awesome. And yeah, I'm a paycheck. <laughs> no paycheck involved, <laughs> like at all. It's like you live and die by every deal that you do, and like it's everything you bring in like goes to the business first, and you know that like that's like maybe I could take a salary right now, but you know that every dollar that's going into that business like needs to go into the business to make sure that it keeps going. So it's like as an owner you have this like kind of a burden of like you need to and make they've done that and doing it. Yeah, it's like you need to make sure that this is working before you take benefit. Um and that's an exhausting exhausting process. Um, Absolutely. So but I, I mean I had a lot of support. Like, you know, I had I had family supporting me. I had like you know, I had friends supporting me, and I had a really good partner. Um, her name is Kimberly Crew, and she runs a number of different kind of computer companies around the country. Um, and she's a serial entrepreneur. She's like one of these people that, you know, she always said, that, like, I get pissed off, and I start a company to fix it. There you go. And this is one of those companies. So basically, in terms of electronics recycling, you have an industry that's entirely – um, most of the money comes from improper exportation practices. To China, yeah. To China, to India, to Africa. I mean, there's like fields of PVC wiring in Ghana that kids are burning and taking out copper. I mean, there's areas in China where like, 
Like, there's a city called Guayu in China, the most polluted city on, in, the, in the world. Oh, uh, yeah. Like, you see kids, like, taking circuit boards and dunking them in Aqua Regia to, take, to strip off gold. And then you see those chemicals being thrown in the same water that everybody's washing their clothes in. It's like, it's an environmental disaster. But it's like, I kind of want to stay away from doom and gloom because it's like, there's ways of addressing it. And that's mm -hmm. like actually choosing providers that like, you know, maybe they're, they're like a nth degree more expensive, but they're actually doing the process in a way that directly benefits, you know, directly benefits your environment and your society as a whole. So what we were trying to do is we were trying to like provide an option to like small to medium sized businesses or it's like if they're getting rid of 300 laptops, like chances are 200 and you know 50 of them might work with you know changing one part. Mm -hmm. And it's like why not extend the life cycle of that machine and give it to somebody in need or give it to somebody who like has you know the opportunity to buy a refurbished product instead of just you know chalking it up to scrap and you know digging the gold out of it. Yeah, exactly. Uh, totally. So we were trying to focus on refurbishment when a lot of the companies in the sector were focusing on, you know, what can I get out of this in terms of metals? Mm, but yeah, yeah. I mean, we we also had in place like a network of of companies that we we could trust and were local. That it's like within 50 miles of Philadelphia, if we had a machine that couldn't be resurrected, we knew that we had somebody in our network that would actually, you know get a part and, you know, like strip it for metals in a really su supportive way. So like we worked with one firm that was, had a welfare to work pipeline. Um, and they were based out in West Philadelphia. So it's like, I could take electronics from a center city office. And if I couldn't refurbish them, I could take them to like 59th street and know that they would be and watch them be destroyed. Okay. And I could like be my customers. So how like, did you end up at city coho? <laughs> Long story. Um, so I, uh, being a business development person, you kind of just have to be everywhere all at once. Mm -hmm. Like you always have to be out there. There was not a single night that I wasn't schmoozing and boozing. Yeah. Um, schmoozing and probably not a good way. Yeah. But, um, I worked from home for the most part, which I don't know if you know anybody on this program has had that experience, but it's a yeah, hi. <laughs> hey, yeah, I work from home. That's, that's what's on the home base. Yeah. Yeah, it can be a really incredibly lonely experience. Um, yeah. And depending on how you know uh, uh, disciplined you are, you can get really distracted and really easily. <laughs> it, yeah, exactly. You just go do that right now, and we'll talk later. Squirrel. Um, <laughs> But um, I started I started getting involved in the co-working spaces. I started going around the city and finding out what these communities were. I like stopped at Indy Hall. I stopped at Venture Forth. I stopped at Ben's desk. I stopped at all like the places that I knew were doing events. And I just wanted to feel for like who's out there. Like what are these people doing? And it, it wasn't even a business development thing at that point. I just wanted to find out like like what's what's going on around me that I don't know about that I can geek out over. Um, yeah. And one of the things that happened is this group Nexus was running a co-working pop-up where they just, they took over Good Karma Cafe for a day and like they brought a bunch of eco geeks out to co-work with each other in this kind of facilitated space where they could like you know, up, create conversation. Um, it was a cool idea and I got to, um, I got to meet their founder who's the guy that I get to work with every day now. And we had like a two hour conversation about what I was doing and kind of his ideas on integrated process and sustainability movement as a whole. And I'm just like, we need to talk again. And two days later, we went, we went out for coffee and had another two and a half hour conversation. And then half an hour after that, I had a job. That's awesome. Um, so I started this history. It's just like, you never know, like that was a day too that I was like working from home and I felt really bogged down and I'm like, I'm not going to go to this. I'm just going to like, call it a day and go to sleep and, it's and fate, it's fate, you like, know, like completely changed my life. It's awesome, buddy. Well, Drew, this is awesome. Where can we find you online? Okay. So I just resurrected my pathetic excuse for a Twitter account. First. Uh -huh. So, um, where are you on Twitter? Um, I'm at ask your folks, ask your folks. <laughs> 
Spelled F O U L K E S. Oh, F O U. I saw it again. Yeah. Um, and then honestly, my my Twitter account is is the space account. It's Conexus. C O underscore Nexus. Find out like you know everything that's going on here. Find out what our companies are doing. Find out like what events we're running here. How we're uniting community. Like it's a cool it's a cool little oasis in the middle of Philadelphia, where some truly innovative and cool stuff happens. This is the Coho, is that what it is? Coho mm -hmm. Nexus, Co, Co underscore Nexus, right? Yeah, that's the one. Awesome, my friend. Awesome. So, um, and what's the website? Website citycoho.com, C-I-T-Y-C-O-H-O. So can people come by and say hi and check you out? Like, what, how do you go about doing that? Um, you know, come by, grab a tour, let, let me know what you're working on. So. Well, this well, this show is not going to go out for a few a, a few weeks because I have a backlog of episodes. So when okay. this goes out live, you'll be able to see it on 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 the show. Totally. So by the by the time the world sees this, it, it will be old news, but it's going to be okay because it's exciting. It's like good old news. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Awesome, Drew. Well, cool. thank you for thank you for you know, joining us. This has been awesome. Yeah. Thanks for having me. This is an all. I love it. It's, you know, it's it makes these podcasts awesome. So, all right. Thanks, Drew. So long.